Welcome to the Seed Stars World Competition 2020, which will be fully online this year. Um, this year, we have uh, an amazing jury that will be helping us to um, judge the different startups that we'll be pitching today. The first one that I'd like to introduce is Cedric Valberger, uh, who is a serial entrepreneur um, and also investor and invests uh, mainly in early stage startups across Europe, America, with his company Tomahawk VC. We have also Ramana Lieberhof, who's um, also an investor uh, based out of Berlin, that is uh, investing mainly in climate and environment, but also gender, smart cities, future of work, and uh, compound technology innovation. She will be uh, helping us today in judging these different companies uh, alongside myself, uh, one of the co-founder of Seedstars, and I've been uh, a judge and an investor over the past seven years at Seedstars. In order to accompany us, uh, we are going to invite different experts for each startup. Uh, and the first one today is uh, Shruti, that is head startup catalyst in SME Ventures, at IFC, World Bank, uh, based out of Nairobi. My name is Hilda. I'm the founder and CEO of Pezesha. Pezesha is a holistic digital financial and credit scoring infrastructure connecting small businesses with working capital here in Kenya. We basically provide working capital because we believe these businesses are going to be the future job creations for Africa. This is a $328 billion opportunity in Africa. We have been already in operation for three years and we are already addressing this gap through our scalable digital financial value chain infrastructure where we connect small businesses with institutional lenders, MFIs and banks, and out of that provision of our infrastructure, we take a 20% interest commission and credit scoring uh, fee for every borrower that we credit score through our platform. I'll tell you the story of Miriam, who started with us in 2017 when we began operations. Miriam is a small merchant, sells wholesale products in FMCG sector. He started with us, we empowered her with our financial education where we gave her tools to manage her business efficiently. She was able to build digital history of her transactions over three years and graduate to a loan of $3,000 in three years. She has now been able to grow inventory for her business, grown by 3x in income. She has employed now five people across Nairobi, opening other branches. She has contributed to her community and referred other women like her to benefit in Pezesha. And now Miriam can dream of a better future for her and her children in the next coming years. We have been able to raise 1.2 million pre-seed round in the last 18 months. We have been able to empower more than 200,000 businesses. Out of that 60% are women-led small businesses. We have disbursed more than $1.6 million to 75,000 loans and 4,000 lenders in our marketplace. I'm a second-time entrepreneur. I have built a fast fintech company was Atele, which was acquired in 2015 at a 20x return for the investors that were involved. Today, I'm asking for $700,000 investment to be able to empower more Miriams, more than 50,000 of them. We have a revenue growth of 400,000 in the last three years, and now we want to hit $1 million just in the coming year. Our financial education is digital. We just launched it three months ago. We are empowering small businesses with financial education tools, and at this time, they are still benefiting by learning more of how to grow their business. We are the first digital infrastructure in Kenya approved by the Capital Markets Authority under the Sandbox program. Thank you. I, I would have a first question for you. Um, you mentioned that, that example of, of that customer. Um, how do you acquire that, that first customer and, and how, does it, how does it work? Who are, what are your acquisition channels? So we acquire people like Miriam through supply chain entities. So we've partnered with suppliers in FMCG sector to start with. So that's fast moving consumer goods. So with those suppliers, we go to them who are our anchor acquisition um, strategists. 
and they help us to then reach to their already existing wholesalers and retailers, which are thousands of them. What's the biggest challenge that you're facing at the moment? Well, beyond the COVID-19, uh, which is a challenge that everyone is facing, uh, because our businesses have been affected by cash flow. So we are still seeing how to support them in this as part of our fiduciary duty. And we have been able to give them longer payment periods. And for those ones in the supply chain sector in Kenya right now, they haven't been affected that much. So we are still lending to them and ensuring they are in business to provide food and basic necessities to the public. So uh, we are not a lender. We are an infrastructure or an intermediary provider mm -hmm. of technology. And so what we have, uh, we provide as value add uh, or value proposition is the marketplace uh, for lenders to be able to come in and get quality small businesses that they can lend to. And that is why they are able to generate good returns at a default rate of less than 2%. In the long term, of course, we still do not want to be balance sheet lenders. There are so many of them in the market. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, it's crowded here in Kenya and Shruti can attest to that. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of activity, as Hilda rightfully said, in, uh, in balance sheet lending. So there's been uh, a number of startups that have gained significant scale, and I'm sure you've heard of some of them. There's Tala, there's Branch. And I think around six months ago, the government in Kenya created this coalition where banks would start lending to um, micro SMEs. Uh, loans that are under $2,500. And there was a lot of chatter around it. So there was a lot of money coming into, uh, into this space. In, in some markets, like if you look at India, these, this, is, this would be like a deal, uh, a lead generation fee. Mm -hmm. And running a business model on lead generation can be quite challenging. I think the interesting thing, at least based on Hilda's pitch so far, has been how she is monetizing not just as a lead generation fee from banks who do lend to these businesses, but also as a portion of the interest income that the lenders make. We see ourselves really as, um, um, you know, for lack of just making it simpler, as an exchange platform and, and, and not as a lead generation platform. So exchange means, if you think of, uh, if you think of NSC here in Kenya, Nairobi Stock Exchange, Currently, the businesses that are listed there are big businesses, but this, the market for small businesses that have the potential to grow the capital markets doesn't exist. And even if it exists, it doesn't allow them to raise capital like gems. And so we are an exchange for the future of small businesses to be able to be connected with working capital. Hilda, fantastic um, success so far, and you're serving a really, really important need. I'm gonna ask a slightly different question than the commercial one, because that's been very well covered, which is actually around the relationship between financial education um, and evolving kind of customer needs. So we are seeing the, the needs changing, um, and that is basically informed by the data we collect. Uh, we cannot have, a lot of agents going around to monitor all this business. We believe that's not scalable. And so we've really leveraged on the power of data, which then we collect uh, from the uh, mobile tool we give them, which manages their daily, monthly transactions. And also it manages the way they, um, they spend on a business. So it's a budget monitoring tool. What, what could cause your, your company to fail? So I will say people. And then the last thing I will say is... Uh, crisis that uh, we cannot be able to manage. So uh, COVID-19 is here, but we have done a very good job as a team to manage this situation. We've put measures in place. We have reduced costs. We are over communicating to our customers, partners, and employees. And we believe that if we continue with the measures we have put in place as of this week, we will be able to survive and still fulfill the mission that we have set and the vision for Pesesha. So I do not know what will stop us from reaching this vision unless, unless it's a crisis that uh, puts us on a lockdown for the next three years. I have 10 years of experience in fintech space uh, in Kenya. And someone would ask me, why are the other lenders not building infrastructure like yours? They have the money, the resources more than Pezesha, mm -hmm. possibly they've raised lots of money. Uh, why can't they jump into what you're doing? And the answer is this, it's hard to build these kind of infrastructures. 
uh, it takes a lot of time and I don't think majority of the digital lenders in the market are patient to be able to build this kind of infrastructures. Thank you so much. The biggest challenge for her will be competitive, will be the competitive market. So it's less about people wanting to lend. It's more about who are they lending to. I have to say, compared to a lot of businesses that I've seen try to do this, she's actually accomplished a lot more than many, even some that are better funded. So I found it for, for relative to the early stage, really quite impressive. And a lot of that is to do with the team who were one of the most solid I've seen. I like her as a founder. I like her background. I think it makes the story makes sense. Um, what I would think is that partnerships are super important um, in this game um, to, to roll this out, um, either within uh, their current uh, geographies or across Africa. I couldn't find much information about that in a pitch that we didn't really get to talk about it. I mean, I understand she has, she has some partnerships, but I... I'd be curious to understand a bit more, like who on the team is really in charge of that and what, what have they done in the past that uh, sets them up for success to, to build out all these partnerships? I met Hilda maybe two years ago when she was just sort of conceptualizing Pizisha. And her background from, from my conversation back then was uh, she had done a lot of work on supply chains with mm -hmm. FMCG and uh, Coca-Cola type companies. Mm -hmm. And so her, her network of borrowers that she's been leveraging comes from that experience. But as Pierre Alain said, the money coming in is probably going to be less of the challenge as opposed mm -hmm. to the supply side, which is, which is where mm -hmm. I think her strengths are. But I mean, as an entrepreneur, I think she's quite impressive. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not a market where you find people who mm -hmm. live yeah. through a full cycle of a startup. Um, and also then taking that knowledge to, to try sort of extending to a different business space, utilizing what she built in the previous, mm -hmm. previous cycle. So I think on those aspects, I actually do like uh, what she's doing. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Amir. I'm CEO and co-founder of Racing. Uh, based in Singapore, Racing started two and a half years ago. As you know, the whole energy infrastructure is going through drastic transformation. And this transformation is mainly driven by a few factors, by factor of renewable energy sources, which basically um, drastically dropping price of so energy sources like solar, wind energy, by adoption of energy storage systems like batteries, EVs, and of course, digitalization of the whole ecosystem with internet access almost everywhere and high adoption of machine learning and AI uh, models. All these together driving traditional grid infrastructure into the smart grid. So Resync, it's a cloud-based platform which aggregates enormous amount of data from various domains. A bit of overview how a solution works like. We either integrate the data collection module from the customer side or we can install our own. And then we use standard industrial communication protocols to collect real-time data. We run it through our machine learning algorithms to understand the customer behavior. And then using that uh, output, we basically take real-time control action in order to provide the energy efficiency for our customers. And not only the energy assets, but we also integrate IoT devices. And then all the aggregated data is, of course, uh, processed on a cloud and fit into the customer, into the nice um, user interface. We are a B2B company. We're focusing mainly on um, corporates. And we do first pilot run with them. And then we integrate our solution to all their portfolio sites. We are looking at the market of around $10 billion at the moment, and this market is constantly growing because of the high adoption of renewables and, of course, digitalization. Entire team is um, techy. Um, myself, I used to work in the solar industry, and my co-founder, she's a mastermind of our solution. She did her PhD specifically focusing on developing control grids for energy and power systems. And her background is fully on the uh, energy space, and that's why we started um, to work on this together because we clicked from the day one and we know what are the issues in the market and what we can do for it. Thanks a lot for, for, this, uh, for, for this presentation. I would have a, a first question for you. Um, so sure. you, you generate revenues and from, from different yeah. things, from the hardware part, as well as a subscription from customers, if, I'm, if I understood yes. correctly. Uh, what is the split yeah. more or less now? At the moment, because the industry is still picking up, we're still deploying hardware to most of our customers. But some of our customers, they already have the hardware. And on a longer run, we feel that this hardware part will phase out. 
So you will become more of a software company than a hardware yeah, company we in start, the future. We started, yes, yes. We started as a software company, but um, as I said, we did hardware integration just to provide end-to-end solution to the customers. Racing is playing in a very interesting part of the market. Um, they are integrating different type of energy assets and helping their customers. So while their current uh, targetable market might be small, it's also a market that is growing very rapidly and uh, they've been able to capture the currently available niche and grow on the back of it. How do you see this changing in terms of the increasing pressure for climate-related uh, financial disclosure? Yeah, so on uh, regards to the first question, is it's actually opening up a bigger market for us. So I don't know how it is in um, other parts of the world, but in Singapore, uh, mm-hmm. every IPO company needs to provide a sustainability report at the end of the financial year. Hey, Mir. Um, I must know a lot of B2B SaaS companies. Usually we look at uh, two core competencies. Uh, number one, you have to build it. And I see that a lot of your team is technical, so I, I trust that that's uh, fairly covered. And then the other yeah. core competency is you have to sell it, right? And, uh, yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear a bit about your traction, about your approach, and how to bring this into the market uh, or, or how to grow uh, your market share. And then also a bit of an outlook on how you see this accelerate over the next 12 months, for example. So we focused more on a tech part and we didn't do sales at all for the first year. So we spent that angel money, you know, you know, we had certain angels who believed in ID and then we spent that money on the product. At the moment, you can see, I think, only eight people, but we are 12 at the moment. So we have two sales guys, uh, myself and one of the uh, sales uh, employee of ours. So, as I said, we go to the conferences. Or most of the time, it's basically the um, uh, energy events that are happening in the region. And that's one of the reasons how I know the Katerina from before as well. So, in the next 12 months, what we see, I mean, we had some, um, quite a big goals, I would say, frankly, for this year. But due to this uh, pandemic things, all the sales suddenly stopped. Uh, of course, going forward, uh, we will have to build a sales team, which basically uh, more experience into the B2B sales main revenue is from the hardware and up to today revenue is around uh 150 150 plus okay what are the 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 trends in the energy sector that would support or not um the the business of rethink from your perspective Hmm. yeah well we've already mentioned one of them which is uh the need for decentralization of uh assets um but it's only one of the trends um the other two that um are very important for the energy sector is uh digitalization and uh, the third one is uh decarbonization um uh, in, introduction of uh, clean renewable energy sources and um what Rising does quite in a clever way is combine those three together and tries to provide solution that sort of um, address uh, each of them. Uh, decentralization by bringing different assets together and helping companies to manage them in a smarter way. Uh, digitalization, just using uh, uh, new tools, uh, analytical tools and reporting tools that the companies need today. And then, of course, uh, uh, the introduction of renewable energy sources is at the core of its value proposition. Uh, you know, it takes them longer time just because of the B2B nature of the market to take up. So I'm not surprised by the by the speed of their development, um, which is slower than um, other maybe B2C type of startups. What do you think uh, would make your startup uh, fail? Oh, <laughs> um... I hope it will never happen. <laughs> Let's start from there. When you deal with big company and you deploy your solution and then something went wrong and they basically all went to crap and then that company can tell like, you know, hey, uh, I used recent solution. It my all, sorry. Uh, uh, it basically went to crap with all my uh, assets and I don't think I'm going to use it anymore. And if that company is credible, credible in a market, that basically spread of what can work really bad on your reputation. So that's one of the reasons. You're trying to, um, so, so you might raise another round. Uh, what, how much are, are you raising and what valuation are you? Uh, we are planning to raise around uh, 3 million USD. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a nice day or evening. Depends on where you are, guys. <laughs>
of course there are companies that are trying to enter that space but they've done it intelligently because uh, Emir is from um, renewable energy background his co-founder is um, you know PhD has a herself AI capabilities right so they were able to combine that together and bring to the market something that works the question about what will make them fail is that if they stop trying that's the only thing that I see will stop them fail you know they are on a good trajectory it's just for energy it takes time I can absolutely see why they are better than a lot of things that are out there. And I really like the fact that they've started out uh, renewable first, technology first, automatically learning first. That's that's a real advantage for them. I don't think it's just salespeople. I mean, although Cedric, I completely agree, they're going to have to do well there. But it's really commercial and partnering strategy. I think they've done something smart in taking a strategic investment from the grid operator uh, or transmission operator in Indonesia. But I actually think they need to partner and quickly with someone like a PwC or something, someone like that who's actually working at the highest level to figure out an integrated climate reporting and risk strategy, because that will really elevate their offer. If they continue to try and sell it by itself, um, I'm not sure they can ever hire a sales team that's big enough or deep enough to really quickly get on the flywheel of, um, of commercial success here. Sounds great, but it's also rather terrifying because it, doesn't mean, it means they just don't have a clear story. <laughs> So are we comparing them to other solutions in the market and are we comparing them to other startups that you would be able to invest in? That's Both, the core actually. question. Hmm? Whoever, whoever is eating the cake. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, they are, they are creating a new cake. That's the thing. <laughs> mm. They are one of the companies that are creating a new keg and they are riding a wave of a new trend in the energy sector. That's how I would describe it, right? This is an incredibly complex area and I wouldn't have appreciated as much had I not worked for one of the players looking at all the companies in the sector. They've actually, first of all, they have done far better than a lot of companies that are better funded at this stage, you know, in more mature markets already. So I give them a lot of credit for that. Secondly, the fact that they have a self-learning constantly on learning tool that's helping them optimize across a range of variables is really differentiated. And there is going to be a barrier to entry. So we have a new startup now pitching, uh, Optial uh, from Turkey with Ozan and Tuba that will be uh, presenting their company. And we also have Mev. Uh, that is an expert in the sector that will also give us a lot of insights on uh, on the business of Optil. Hello, my name is Ozan. Uh, Optil is a transportation route optimization SaaS. Uh, Optil makes life better for consumers, shippers, uh, carriers, and drivers by enabling low cost and on time logistics. Optil route optimization can be used by shippers and carriers to automate and optimize transportation planning. So Optil optimizes fleet selection, order location, and visit sequencing. And with Optial, these organizations can reduce fuel costs, fleet size, and driver costs significantly while improving on-time deliveries. The key differentiators are, we have built a very comprehensive data model to capture a more realistic representation of the operations. And our modular and tunable algorithm design allows to create tailor-fit solutions for various business environments. We have now five active customers generating around uh, $14,000 in MR. A notable customer is a last mile residential delivery company, which is one of the largest in Turkey for big box items like household items. Optiol provides $1 million annual savings to this company, which corresponds to six times uh, of their investment. Tuba and I are the founders with PhD degrees in supply chain optimization from Georgia Tech and over 10 years of experience in building decision support systems. Our CTO, Turan, is a software engineer and he brings 10 years of experience in enterprise software architecture and applications. We are raising $1 million to be spent uh, mostly for sales and marketing and continue development of our product. Thank you. You guys are a couple, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. <laughs> Couple entrepreneurs, that's nice. <laughs> okay. Um, based on your experience, um, how much are the customers 
really needing these kind of, of uh, solutions. So from a consumer standpoint, I do think that there, um, it, it is quite important, uh, not just in terms of uh, saying that we can get the product uh, for customers within a certain period of time, but then ensuring that that happens. Are there a lot of players out there and what kind of solutions? So what would be then your competitive ad advantage against them possibly? So there are like two types of players, like one are the uh, legacy players. So they have been in the business for a long time, uh, but their solutions were built uh, before this e-commerce era. So their solutions uh, do not satisfy the need of this new uh, generation of customers. Uh, with the new players, yes, there are uh, new players coming in. It will be a competitive area. Uh, I agree on that. So to do that, we try to identify what are the weaknesses, uh, why still even the big companies are uh, relying on manual planning or uh, experience of planners. Uh, so we created the structure of a tailor fit approach. So our, we create a very flexible algorithm which can be tuned or like, like a Lego approach can be assembled for the need of each companies. Because uh, really in cities, each city is different. Some cities are very dense, some cities are isolated. It can be a coastal city or inland city. Uh, so you cannot solve the problem with a single algorithm. So uh, that, that's the uh, differentiator we have. It can adapt to the conditions and then fine-tune the uh, parameters to meet the demand of that. Is this a problem that needs to be solved on a global or on a local level? Or in other words, can you become the best solution for a specific market while someone else captures another market? Or will there be one global player that's best everywhere? It depends on your flexibility. So that's what we aim. So we want to be like a global player. That's why we want to create it flexible so that it, uh, even in any geography, as long as we get map mapping data, as long as uh, we can calculate driving distance at times as an input, uh, the solution will work. Uh, that's what we are uh, aiming for. Um, what I understood was, yes, you are trying to solve it on a global level, um, but you think in the mid short to midterm you have an advantage um, locally because you um, are uh, uh, tailor-made for, for a certain geography. Just so that I understand the unit economics as well, like, um, so what is the, the, the lifetime value of a customer and what is the cost of acquisition of, of each customer? So our average monthly revenue from customer is uh, around three thousand three hundred dollars from two thousand nineteen numbers, and our customer acquisition cost again based on our all efforts in terms of sales and marketing acquiring those customers we get uh, nine thousand five hundred dollars. So our payback uh, period becomes two point eight eight months, and uh, in the lifetime value calculation we don't have enough data because uh, we have zero churn rate right now, mm -hmm. uh, but we know that in order to have a lifetime value of customer acquisition cost uh, three we need just 8.6 months uh, lifetime value assumption and our current uh, contracts are uh, annual subscription so that is more than that so if we assume our lifetime value is just one year that will be 4.17 lifetime value of our customer acquisition cost but with the big uh, customer that we have a contract uh, we have a five-year contract so customer wants us to make uh, longer contracts okay so it's nine thousand dollars to acquire one customer so that was the what? ratio in 2019 because yeah. all of the customers didn't convert yet so we are still working yeah. on that but that is the conservative number from 2019. so as you're talking to your customers what are the biggest challenges you have in terms of convincing them to use your software and also um, what are the data points that you're collecting that are helping you to do the optimization and um, for, oh, yeah, so if you can answer those two, that would be great. Uh, so the challenges uh, generally are uh, if they have a habit of like planning this manually over the years, uh, there's like a change management uh, issue. So the top management, if they see the numbers like the CFOs or like the logistics manager, they can see the value. They can see potential improvements in customer service and uh, cost reductions. Uh, what they are not sure generally is if they implement the solution, uh, will the drivers uh, adapt to this dynamic planning because what they are used to do is uh, just allocating static neighborhoods for each neighbor, uh, for each driver. They are familiar with the environment and every day they are uh, going to the same places. Uh, so this is uh, good for them, but not for the business because now the demand is variable. You cannot uh, send out all your drivers every day, otherwise it's uh, very costly. And in terms of optimization data, uh, the data is uh, we connect to map service providers uh, to get traffic uh, data and road distances. 
from customer systems, uh, we get data related to orders. Uh, what's the pickup location? Where, where is the delivery location? And uh, what are the expected delivery hours, like the earliest time that we can deliver to the latest mm -hmm. time? Uh, the order size in terms of capacity. What do you think will be the impact of, uh, of uh, the coronavirus? Uh, for uh, the operations, so it actually like people, logistics is in the headlines all the time, which we, we are not very familiar, like supply chain logistics, like even in uh, all news media, they are talking about logistics supply chain. Also, people are now like e-commerce is booming because people not go out shopping. So the volumes are increasing and uh, companies are not prepared uh, for this change immediately. Uh, so uh, the, the last two weeks, uh, we received like new inbound orders uh, from customers, even from uh, very uh, small size of a fleet, because they cannot, uh, they say they cannot plan this uh, scale of like grocery deliveries and other things. Uh, I think in the short term, uh, there will be like a quick interest. More people will be interested in using the solution. What we are not sure is, uh, will they have uh, the budget for investment. But for that case, our model is a SaaS model, a subscription model. They can just pay monthly. And we even plan to offer like a trial period for them so that they just get started. Because like the solution paybacks for itself. Because like the My colleagues have done a great job of asking today questions to you, Ozan and Tuba. So I'll ask a tomorrow question because I notice it's mentioned in your deck. So obviously a lot of the large players, um, the goal for them, the aspiration for all kinds of reasons is to move to autonomous logistics as quickly as possible. And therefore there's an alternative path in the sector, which is about integrating with the OEMs on that future path. So I just wonder how you see this playing out um, and you know, just how you look at it as a business. Uh, so we see it as an opportunity uh, and like in our like R&D, projects, we want to build some partnership with OEMs. Uh, for example, an organization in Finland, uh, mm -hmm. they are introducing a program with Scania, like it's the track, uh, yeah. tracking company. And one of the topics was like autonomous dispatching routing solutions for mm -hmm. autonomous vehicles. Uh, so we are, uh, we, we'll engage, we'll try to engage with them. Uh, or with Ford Motor Company, they have an R&D mm -hmm. in Turkey. We are also uh, talking with them and uh, try to work on some R&D projects together in oh, those areas. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thanks Thank for your time. Thank you. I think the, the one gap for me, and I had wanted to test a question, sorry, but I didn't get in quick enough. The one gap for me is they don't have any logistics um, on the team. It's all um, industrial engineers, but there doesn't seem to be anybody that is uh, coming from the logistics background. I feel that there is, it's a very competitive market, and I think that um, not only um, are there the competitors that they highlighted on their um, on their deck but also if you take ups if you take dhl they actually do it themselves internally they build their own systems internally and they do route optimization and i think the last thing as well is that scaling in countries they have to consider um, the different regulations they'll also have to consider language um so you know uh, the different languages and especially in mina and uh, that's going to be um quite significant um, but if they can get regional um, players, then I think that that would be very helpful. Would you yourself invest in the company? Mm, I don't know. Um, I don't know enough about the market in MENA. It's not clear to me. And I would want to go like look at those numbers and that. There is a lot of pressure on businesses around their logistics. Um, there's a lot of costs associated with that. And so they do need to reduce as much waste as they can. And a big part of that waste is route optimization, is is route um, is optimizing the route. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think they've they've been fortunate in a way in starting in Turkey, which has both large distances, a lot of complexity urban environments and a big kind of e-commerce challenge. But I, I'm concerned by the speed at which they could scale outside of Turkey into other markets that already have well-funded local competitors. So we have our next company, which uh, is Studi Free with Dasha that will be presenting today. Um, we also have as an expert Federico, which was who was the winner of Seed Stars World last year, that will be help uh, that will help us 
um, to give us some insights uh, on on the ad tech sector and and uh, also on the, on the market in in general and the business of Dasha. So please, Dasha, uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Dasha, I'm CEO and founder of StudyFree. StudyFree is an online platform that helps talented people from any country to get any kinds of international education, including with scholarship and grants. And our students right now already study in 37 different countries and with more than 4 million of US dollars of received scholarship and grants. How this is possible? That's how it usually works. You get to our platform and you're going to see a huge database of different programs already matched with scholarship and grants. You pick the program and then you have all admission requirements automatically uploaded. Each requirement is going to be followed with itself instructions, useful materials, samples of the documents. You're also going to be able to find all necessary additional services right there on spot. Online schools, exam prep center, student accommodation, and so on and so forth. We launched our platform in April last year, one year ago, and since then we managed to acquire almost 23,000 effective registered users from more than 108 countries, and around 7% of them are paying to us. Uh, last month, we managed to make 60,000 US dollars of monthly revenue. We are operationally profitable, and all of this were done with zero funds raised so far. We estimated our market to be around 15 billion of US dollars, and the one we can actually target almost 1 billion of US dollars. We also managed to acquire uh, a lot of top uh, help on our side, uh, such as advisors from a sister's family, Basgotska, and just recently we've been invited by top acceleration programs uh, such as Techstars New York and Berkeley Skydeck in San Francisco. I personally genuinely believe that education is the major, the most powerful instrument that can break any barrier for the personal growth and development. So let's make it available for everyone. Thank you. One question, one, one number stuck out on that uh, market size and our potential slide. And uh, if I read correctly, you want to get to uh, over half a billion dollars within the next two to three years. Uh, yeah. which um, would mean like uh, uh, 1,000x uh, compared to what you're doing today. So there is a market, there is definitely low customer position cost in our case. There are scalable, um, scalable channels across like different metrics and segments. And what we did right now, we did, uh, my initial funding was 300 US dollars. We haven't raised any funds yet. So let's imagine like we're going to be raising and just going to be raising purely for growth because we're already profitable at the moment. You just mentioned, and I also saw it at the slides, that um, you have a really low cost uh, acquisition cost. I would like to understand a little bit more which are your main acquisition channels and how are you measuring that cost? Yeah, so um, as, so first of all, we have very high referral rates. Uh, so like our NPA score is 9.87, so we have a lot of, a lot of organic. Uh, second, the most effective that actually allows us to, to track customer and have low customer acquisition costs, these online webinars. So we have advertisements on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and so on, targeted advertisement that's going to be free online webinar on how to study abroad with scholarship and grants. People register it and at the end, they pay the access to the platform. You have 30% conversion rate. And it's done automatically each day for every country. Hi, Dasha, could I ask you a question? Which markets do you see as having the most growth uh, in demand? We have active paid users from CIS markets, Russian speaking, uh, Latin America, Brazil mostly, mm -hmm. uh, Africa, Southeast Asia. I personally believe actually the biggest growth we see right now is actually African countries. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually what my, I believe in. But then you have African countries who like grown massively in terms of the income, uh, the internet interest has grown massively. So for me, that's the next billion market. And I think yep. it's really important to enter them right now and to be the pioneer in the market, mm -hmm. like taking mm -hmm. the, the largest take. On all the people that applied to your platform, how many got a scholarship in percentage? 98%, yeah, 98.3 so far. I think uh, this highest percentage, uh, we have the scoring system that kind of like evaluates the background of the person and matches with the pro programs that uh, are the most probable. So I think that's kind of, kind of like the growth hack in our case, uh, because we're really able to match students with the, with the programs with the highest. So this ability to match them, uh, kind of like their background and the opportunities that are available in the market, there's like a lot for any segment, any type of the students that actually allows us to, to have this really, really high uh, success rates. And, and on the, so they pay by installments, right? It's a monthly yeah. payment. Yeah. And, but you still book the full revenue 
in advance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how much of that is not paid back or, or people are stopping? stopping the churn rate? The, the last churn rate we calculated was around like 7% usually, but that's usually because people change their minds. You know, like, uh, I got a job. I'm not going to go. I got like one girl and got pregnant. I'm not moving. So like, they're almost like personal circumstances. But uh, just because people don't pay, we don't have it. Because I think we managed to consistently show the value, show the progress. And uh, if their plans on education in general are changing, they're paying on time. That's kind of like smooth and stable. Mm -hmm. What do your unit economics look like? So yeah, when we when I mentioned the uh, the customer acquisition cost for paying across different channels is forty dollars, uh, the lifetime value on average per paying user is one thousand US dollars, and it's not necessary if they pay us right away like buying this premium package is because uh, they also buying a lot of additional services from partners like they're gonna study English, they're gonna prepare for the exams, they're gonna find you know, tickets, accommodation, and we all get percentage commission on the revenue share base, so we get like at least. Two three hundred US dollars from active student just from the partner side. Uh, like for this kind of like half premium package, which costs uh, one thousand US dollars, uh, our operational cost is just uh, three hundred dollars. So the rest is just uh, it's just profit. You you said that you you didn't raise money so far, and uh, honestly, what you've achieved uh, without raising money, I think that's. Uh, that's a, that's a great sign of, of uh, I think, uh, the great entrepreneurs from my perspective. Um, <laughs> so congrats on, on that. Um, now, are you in, do you intend to raise, um, to raise money? And if yes, how much? And what valuation do you expect? Yeah, so yeah, we do because uh, we've proven ourselves that there is market, there is attraction. We got this survival DNA fighting for every percentage and the conversion rates and every dollar not just really, you know, like sitting on the money, but really making money and making business out of this. You are now actually the very time to attract funds and to scale and growth, especially internationally on in this market. So we're all like we do, I don't know, like pre seed it depends on the country, how to call it, 500, uh, like that we're raising. Uh, we, if we decide to go to the both of both acceleration programs, each of them gives 100K. So we have around like 300 left and yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay and va valuation is basically the uh, you have something in mind yeah we did agree on evaluation with acceleration programs it's it's for million cost money thank you good luck guys bye thank Thanks. you bye i can give my my brief feedback i sure. i like the founder i know i i realize that she knows a lot about the business and about the industry and i'm aware of the pain of all these students um when when trying to apply to universities i only have a concern right now of what you were saying here about how it's going to look the university's education model in the next five or ten years i would like to see a team how they can adapt or or change their business model their product when the education actually shifts that that's my big concern but i i think it's the business model is fine. I, I don't know. I would like to go a little bit deeper on the unit's economics, but I like the team. I, I understand the problem, and I think they're doing pretty well without any type of financing. I generally agree. I think she's built a great business, you know, absolutely, you know, from scratch with a tremendous amount of insight and obviously a, a kind of commitment to quality and continuous improvement. To me, it's an elite business that has a certain lifetime. It doesn't have the, the depth of impact um, because it's not about being inclusive. It's really going to be about servicing the elite in each of these countries who can really go for it. I just think from, from my personal perspective, um, it's a great business that I wouldn't necessarily invest in because I think she'll run it and grow it really well. Uh, I also think, mm -hmm. you know, it, the, probably the valuation is already a little bit um, high, um, given the race it's going to be to keep up um, in the face of, of increasing complexity. Yeah, I think the only thing I can add is that I really like how um, they growth hack their way, like how they create processes yeah. and automate stuff, um, which is something that, that I don't see often enough. Mm. Um, but it sounded like a very smart way of like making uh, very little look like a lot. 
um, I thought that was very smart of her. The 1,000 X in like two to three years, um, yeah. uh, it'd be, uh, I, I think it'd be interesting to sit down with her and, and get her thought. Like I, that, that would probably be my next step is like to figure out like how much has she actually thought about like what are, how many problems that she's going to encounter in building out the team culture operations on the way there, like how, how much of that is clear to her versus, and then I think it, if it is clear and I think it's great to be so ambitious, if I then discover that she doesn't really understand what 1000X will entail, um, then I would probably just think mm -hmm. it's a bit naive to, um, to have that projection. So next person today uh, to pitch is Roberto from Baoba, live from Mexico. And uh, we also are welcoming Fadi as our expert, uh, who's leading the m &A activities at NASPERS. Hi, everyone. I am Roberto Salcedo, CEO of Baobab. Baobab is becoming the bridge to financial freedom in emerging markets. For the last 15 months, we have been delivering a world-class microfinancing service to underserved people in Mexico. With four people, we have served over 225,000 users, and today we manage a loan book of more than 20,000 loans. All of our loans have a 30-day maturity term. We charge an effective interest rate of 25%, and we lend between $25 to $250. The final purpose of our product is to help our customers develop their own credit history, so in time they can access other financial services and get economic development opportunities. Alongside of each of our loans, we provide a financial education program that becomes part of the evaluation process for a borrower's rebuy. In Mexico, there are some digital lenders already in the market. However, 43% of our more than 200,000 users have never heard of them. And in the short period of time we've been on the market, 9% of our customers have already chosen us after working with some of our competitors. My co-founder and I put together more than 20 years of experience in financing and software development to execute everything Baobab does today. Just in the last six months, our whole business has grown four times over. We disbursed three times as many loans as we did the year before, and we raised $350,000 of equity investment. Thank you very much, guys. Please go ahead with, your, with any questions you may have. Thanks, Roberto, for giving us that background. Uh, the first question I have is, how do you acquire your customers? So from the, from the beginning, we designed our service to be able to provide us with organic growth and force a little mouth-to-mouth. Uh, mouth mouth. So um, right from the beginning, our evaluation process required the applicants to provide four personal references. We interacted with these per four personal references and tried to convert them into users. So that, that, that was our approach from the very beginning. And of course, we are right now using um, all the digital channels we have available to us, Facebook ads, Google ads, our presence in the Play Store. And, and I have another question, which is related to, um, to, to that kind of businesses. It's uh, the over-in-depthness. Uh, how do you make sure that your customers are not um, are not taking too much debt because it's from you, but they might take that from other providers. Uh, how do you ensure that? Of course, this is something of the utmost important for us. That's why we developed our financial education program, just to be able to teach our users how to manage a loan, how to manage debt and their income. And we actually have several business policies in place in order for us to prevent over indebting our customers. It's a it's a very crowded place. Uh, this this uh, kind of of uh, uh, micro lending on smartphone companies. Um, Fadi, what what would be your your take on that from your perspective? I think a lot of these places are are very big markets. They're very large TAMs. So unlike some other traditional consumer internet models where their winner takes all or winner takes most. I think in lending, actually, there's room for multiple players in the market. So I'd be happy to you know, see multiple winners evolve in a market. 
I'm curious though, running a digital only solution means you don't always get to know that much about who your customers are and what they're actually using the funds for. So can you tell me a little bit about who, where, and why uh, the customers borrow? Of course. Um, our product is, the, is um, designed specifically to tend to a small liquidity needs for people, mainly for self-employed people. So people who are funding a very small economic activity, such as people selling through catalogs, people, vendors on the street, uh, taxi drivers, uh, people like this. And our other 50, 60%, sorry, of the portfolio comes from uh, formerly employed people. And they are using it to just replenish their monthly income and be able to, uh, to reach their next payday. Well, since, uh, since we are 100% digital, we are covering the whole, the whole country. So we, are, we have users all around the country. And of course, we have a bit of concentration in the main cities, but we also have some country, countryside customers. What is your net revenue? So what's the um, money that you get to uh, keep from the uh, interest rates? So right now, like I said, we charge an effective interest rate of 25%, so within the 30-day term. And right now, we are, uh, we are producing around $30,000 a month for net interest income. The, and, the, and so it's all your money. It's on your balance sheet. You don't pay that interest to someone else that gives you the money. That, that is correct. It is balanced lending. Okay. Um, and so far, we have funded it just through equity raises. Thank you very much to all. Fadi, on your side, would you, would you invest uh, in, in the company? I would probably say no, in, in all honesty. Um, I think one, unfortunately, is, is a side of the times. Uh, look, this is a space that we spend a lot of time on. We have several investors, uh, sorry, investments in this space. I think given the uncertainty in the economic cycle right now, these are businesses that are going to do very well in boom times uh, and going to be challenging during um, weak economic cycles. So I think just broadly, the, the macroeconomic environment is, is going to be difficult for, for a business like this right now. Uh, I think, too, this is a business where, you know, I, I had said it during the meeting where there's a lot of white space, there's a lot of opportunity for them to, to grow here. Um, but it's a market which is quickly becoming crowded as well. I wouldn't, um, aside from, I mean, I don't know the space too well, but just the fact that they're doing balance sheet lending uh, isn't very interesting to me because it means they're, they're gonna, their growth is going to be capped. So for me, it would be, if I were to invest, um, I think I would invest in a business that already has that part figured out and is able to scale their financing. For me, there has to be some degree of specialization and sophistication around impact at this point. Because, for example, there's a business I know that was doing lending for school fees, um, you know, for vegetable traders and also allowing them a wholesale discount at the back end. I mean, if you think in, in a creative way about really, really deepening your impact for your user, you will gain loyalty and a following and a specialization. But generic balance sheet lending, no matter how well you do it, and I'm sure they're doing it very well, just doesn't feel to me to have the right to succeed. Um, it's going to be about deep pockets. Mm -hmm. that, that's very interesting, all these thoughts, because uh, we do have some companies like that also in our portfolio. For you. Um, and I must say that, so that, that's an interesting business because um, it's, I would not say easy, but like pretty easy to acquire customers um, because you're providing loans. So um, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, at least to attract customers, it, it, it kind of works. So for me, it's the 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 future is still unclear, uh, but short term, it it seems to be um, to be to be quite interesting. And I, I guess it will depend a lot on how they how they position themselves in the future. If they if they are, from my perspective, if they are opening up to other um, to other areas and really use be, uh, loans as a hook, I think that that can be extremely powerful. Also. Uh, in the future. So that would be my, my take on that. So while the jury deliberates, 
let me give you a quick recap of the key things they're probably discussing. As you know, the first thing they'll be looking at is the team. I hope you've no all noticed that this year we have four out of five teams with a female founder. It's way above the usual rates, which is typically around 10 to 15 percent. But the question is, does the team have the right background for the job? There's good industry experience across the board, so no red flags there. But Hilda from Possessia is going to stand out. She's the only one to have had an exit and serial entrepreneurs are highly sought after. Compared to anything the founders say, their track record will speak the loudest. And a good way to judge this is by looking at the revenue growth since they started. All the companies are high growth. They've been expanding between 50 and 100% in the last three months. But the standout growth curve you see here is study free, who have bootstrapped their way to a higher revenue in a shorter amount of time than any of the others. It'd be crazy not to talk about COVID-19 and the jury will definitely be considering what are the potential impacts. The sad reality is that very few businesses are benefiting from the crisis as both consumer and business spending have just been plummeting. The lending space in which Possessia and Baobab operate are going to be hit and SMEs are already failing around us. For Resync, Optial and Study Free, there is going to be both challenges and opportunities. Take Optial as an example. Home deliveries are increasing and optimization will be even more important. But on the other hand, unblocking new budget from customers will be a challenge actually for all of them. A competitive advantage is simply going to be the ability to survive the crisis. And fortunately here, all the companies have a decent runway. Two just raised and the other three have a pretty low burn and a, again, a sizable runway. Finally, the deal is going to be challenged by the jury. Possessia is raising at the higher end, but have a pretty good traction already from the investor community. Resync have already closed their round in December and the next round terms aren't yet known. Optil is somewhere in the middle, while Study Free and Baobab are raising at the lower end and at, a, and at lower multiples, which I think is going to be noticed by the jury. Well, that's my take. Over the last six editions, we've had three winners from Asia, two from Africa and one from LATAM. So let's see which startup and which region are going to take away this year's title. The job for us now is to, to understand which one we, we would like to, to bet on. Pesesha? For me, what came out from the from the discussions were the team is, is quite good, it's especially the background, the experience mm -hmm. uh, had a first exit, uh, even though it's not necessarily completely representative. But I mean, she 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 was in the space and she sold the company, uh, had a good return for the investors. So I think that that was an that was an interesting part. She has experience in that sector as well, even though it's slightly different. The negative part for me is that it's a crowded space, so it's uh, there are a lot of a uh, lot of players. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, um, I agree that the challenging thing is a competitive environment. But to be honest, if I think about the quality of the team as a relative set, that team actually was more um, complete than some that we saw. So that wasn't a particularly weak point from my from my perspective. Mm -hmm. It was one of the stronger. Okay, and then the next one is is uh, rethink. How big really is the market, and how really is it a painkiller versus versus a vitamin, uh, and also how the the competition might come up with with, mm -hmm. with with solutions. I mean, this for me was the one I was most, in a way, yeah. most excited about because I think it is one of the harder spaces to do something good with, and the fact that they've gotten to where they've gotten when others have struggled for three, four, five years to get anything. I think, we, and having, you know, not raised a huge amount of money. I've seen players in this space raise eight, 10 million and not have the, the traction they had. The other thing is that I think they have the, the balance of skills in, in the founding team is, is remarkable. You don't often see, um, and they came out of EF, right? So, I mean, you have this kind of extraordinary combination of AI, technical skill and energy industry experience that's very unusual. And they're working in Asia and with some very big brands already. So I think here, my concern would be that the lack of familiarity with comparators might cause us to downgrade them, but this is the sector I've seen a lot of. I think this is a market that is going to grow significantly. As, as Katarina said, they're really on a set of trends in a way that not many others are. 
I think uh, given that they're in an in a space that is probably the worst of enterprise sales in terms of uh, long lead times and long sales cycles, I was also surprised that um, they already had a bit of traction. And also, I thought it was clever that they they just like when they realized also they need to do some hardware for now, even though their long term vision is uh, software, that they were just able to adapt to that, and that gave them a competitive advantage in this phase. Um, that's something that I really liked because um, it also speaks to the team and their adaptability. Then the next one is is, is Optiol. In the discussion, I, I kind of would have wanted them to say, yes, there is a local advantage and we're not going to try and compete on the global level because we know there's like huge logistics companies that have teams of hundreds of PhDs that are working on these problems. Mm. But none of them understand the, let's say, Turkish market as well as we do. We know all the local players. We know um, all the local regulations. We know the local um I don't know, uh, things that people are used to in terms of like when stuff needs to be delivered and how it needs to be delivered. Unfortunately, I didn't get that answer. So that was a bit of a, I, I, I think I'm, I'm less uh, excited about them now that they said, oh, we're going to compete on the global level. We're going to try mm -hmm. and do both, both be locally present as well as compete on the global level. Um, so that, that was the showstopper for me. Yeah, I agree. And particularly because that's why they're raising funds now. Whereas actually it's a relatively less crowded space in Turkey and they could really do a lot with a market that big, you know, so I would want to see one or two adjacent markets, but not global, not the US, not the Netherlands. Um, the, the next one is, is study free. Um, so something that, that was for me that, that came out from study free is that the, the team seems, seems very good. Uh, like, like we mentioned uh, before, like the, the fact that she was able to, Uh, basically create a company that's mm. generating almost a million in revenues without mm. without funding, I think is, a, was, is an extremely good sign for me. The, the business model and the unit economics are also extremely interesting uh, on that side. Um, so from attraction team and, and business model, I think these are, for me, the, the positive part. What's more uh, challenging is... is uh, Is the market the market size? We've we've mentioned it. Uh, for the moment, she's focusing on a on a niche market, and how much can she uh, really expand in, in in other markets? That's still for me a, a question mark. I mean, amazing founder um, niche market um, will probably dominate in that space, but that'll be challenged over time. One reason why I I would probably I, I would probably feel good about investing in this business is because I feel they are very clever and smart in how they handle their resources, mm -hmm. and so that's always a positive for me. If it's a business that's at the very early stage, I always like founders to be kind of thinking of how can they get the most buck out of every single dollar, and not just mm -hmm. like think of in tens of thousands of dollars suddenly. Finally, we have Baobab, um, so. That that's a market I think that is uh, I would say well known for, for investors because there are a bunch of, of similar companies out there. Um, for me, what what's interesting also, of course, in in these kind of businesses is the the traction that they have, but it's also due it's it's also directly due to the to the kind of model that they're in. Like they're literally throwing money at people. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's not easy, but it's easier to attract people when you throw the money at them. Um, I think that's that explains a big part of, of the traction. The negative part of that model, of course, is it's a crowded space. The other part is that they also depend on on for their whole acquisition on on one single channel, which is mm -hmm. Android. I mean, from my point of view, they're smart guys. They know how to run a loan book, um, but I think there's a number of vulnerabilities as well as competitive. Uh, challenges. I would have really wanted to see someone on their key team who was not coming from an elite finance background who really understood. What I've seen succeed in businesses like this is someone who's literally grown up as a working poor hustling person who really understands the needs intimately and there was no customer insight there that I could determine. What, what would you go for if you had to choose one? have received more than 5,000 applications. We've been in 83 countries, selected 46 startups, 
during five regional summits. And we have reunited them in what's today the largest competition for startups in emerging markets. So after a very long and difficult deliberation with the jury and the investment team, we have a winner. Hilda, you stood out as a charismatic founder with a prior exit and great industry experience. Your business model is quite unique because you're not an on-balance sheet lender. However, our main concern is the intense competition in the lending space. Emir, you're at the forefront of energy digitalization. This is very challenging, but this is a huge opportunity. And we are all convinced that you and your team are the right one to tackle that opportunity, given your deep industry knowledge and technical expertise. But you're still relying a lot on hardware and you're not a pure software company. And the life cycle for sales in that industry is quite long. Tuba and Ozan, we like your technical capacity and we believe that you have built a very strong, robust, flexible solution for route optimization. The jury and the investment team were a bit concerned about the competition and whether the market opportunity is local, regional or global. Dasha, what stand out with you was your capacity to generate $60,000 in monthly revenue with only $600 in funding. I think you clearly got the hustler and hacker attitude that any entrepreneur, especially at an early stage, should have. The jury and myself and the investment team had some concerns, however, on your capacity to serve the lowest income segment of the population in emerging markets, because your positioning is quite premium at the moment. Finally, Roberto, you and your team have a strong financial background. You demonstrated also tenacity when the App Store shut down, which is a great skill that you wanna have as an entrepreneur in such circumstances. However, our concern, again, is around competition, but also in the potential risk of over indebtedness of your, your customers. So, before I announce the winner, I would like to thank all the people and the partners that made this possible, especially during this challenging time. Thank you very much. And before giving the name of the winner, I would like to remind the public that you also can vote for your best startup and we'll announce the public prize winner on our website. So now is the time. The 2020 Seed Stars World global winner is Dasha from Studi Free. Thank you. I feel like my heart is going to pop out. <laughs> the very moment. Oh my God. I remember like the first time we got it first place in Russia. I was like screaming my team like on the whole building. I wish I could be same right now. Thank you so much. My mom was thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wow. <laughs> Do you want to say a few words maybe, Dasha? Um, that, that feels amazing. I mean, um, well, first of all, um, I look like old teams and I think like everyone is doing such an amazing work. 
And I talked to my team like, guys, I mean, everyone is so strong and, and doing like so much, so much like efforts, like no matter like who wins, like they're all amazing. And let's not put high hopes, just going to go back to work. If we win, we're going to go to sleep for one day, <laughs> potentially. So I'm really, really uh, thankful for the Sea Stars, for this opportunity, because I believe um, we've been spoken to so many companies, investors, and mentors, but Sea Stars is the only place that can actually understand what we're doing, what we're building, the markets we're working in, can really support us in the way we need, bringing the impact while still building a business in the country that needed the most. And I'm like the biggest advocate right now. And we have advisors right now. Thanks to you. We have partners. And thank you. Thank you for this competition. Thank you for all these resources. That's, that's the most amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Lesha. Thank you. And, and really congratulations. Like I said, it was a big journey from all these 5,000 applications. We had to choose one winner. Of course, of course, I would like to congratulate all the other participants. We're entrepreneurs ourselves. We know how difficult and hard it is to be an entrepreneur. Uh, it doesn't mean at all that your business is not good, is not good and that uh, we, you might not receive an investment. But, you know, these are uh, the rule of the game. I think you guys done a great job and even though I'm joining from outside, but uh, I was really excited as well. First of all, of course, congratulations to Dasha. Uh, well done. I really hope you, uh, your startup journey will really be exciting and you will make it. I'm happy to be a part of the family as well. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. For us, it was a very good journey. The sea starts starting with the local competition, the regional summit and the world summit. And uh, we are uh, very excited uh, about all of those. So thank you, everyone. So congratulations, Dasha. And thank you very much to the Seed Stars team for our whole journey. It, it was, it's been a very exciting year for us here in Mexico, at, in Baobab. And you guys were part of this, of this exciting year. This is our very first year of operation. I, I just want to say thank you uh, to Seed Stars. Thank you. You know, I'm really honored to meet other entrepreneurs. Uh, congratulations, Dacha. And, you know, I definitely believe that, uh, you know, we're all going to be, you know, at the forefront of uh, building our economies, you know, changing where we are coming from. And of course, at the end of the day, collaboration is going to be key. So let's see how we can share lessons, ideas, how we can help each other and continue to work together during this time and beyond and above to make our businesses succeed. So I would like also to thank again the jury, the partners, and of course, the public. Now we'll have to say digitally goodbye, and I hope to see you all next year. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.